And so most people just don't tell anyone. A small number of those people will tell a loved one, you know, a close family member, a spouse, a friend, someone of that nature. And a very small subset of those will tell a complete stranger, like a, you know, a Sasquatch researcher or investigator or something of that nature. And so one of the questions that I've always asked people, and at this point, you know, I've interviewed over 2000 witnesses since 2002. Um, a lot of that was, you know, during the period of time when I was with the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, especially once Finding Bigfoot became popular, then a lot of reports were coming in. Well, let's say I've interviewed that many claimants. And I would always ask, well, did you ever feel like reporting this to an authority? Law enforcement, uh, game wardens, something of that nature. And the answer was 99.9% .9 of the time, no. Like, oh, did you ever feel like reporting this to local media? And it was absolutely not. And I've seen the same with people in these government roles, you know, whether they are encounters on military installations, which do happen like Fort Bragg in North Carolina, uh, Fort Lewis in Washington, some of these other places, they just don't report it to anyone. Hey, Unexplained Ones, scroll down to the show notes in your app or browser and click the link to buy The Phenomenal Sasquatch by Matt Pruitt. And head over to ParanormalityMag.com to save 10% with promo code BigfootUFO. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's. Did the CIA write Wind of Change by the Scorpions? <laughs> <laughs> As humans busied themselves about the various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied. Dr. Loeb, what percentage chance do you give it that you have indeed uncovered extraterrestrial or non-human technology? With infinite complacence, people went about their affairs, yet across an immense ethereal gulf, intellects vast and unsympathetic through their plans against us. Prior to your abduction, did you believe in UFOs or any sort of alien life form? All things unexplained. So some of that I think sir will say for close session. Hello, all you unexplained ones out there. It's me, CJ Derringer. I am here with my co-hosts, Dr. Mounts and Smitty Neves. And we have an epic show for you. We have got the legend himself, Matt Pruitt here, to talk to us about the legend <laughs> Sasquatch, the author of The Phenomenal Sasquatch. Just in chatting with him before this show, I can tell that you know so much about this creature that we are all so fascinated with. So let's dive right into it, Matt. How did you get interested in Sasquatch? Well, you know, I've told the story many times, so I'll, I'll make it brief. I won't belabor it. But like many people who do investigate the phenomenon, I had an experience when I was young. It was when I was 17, and that was in the mountains of Northeast Georgia where I grew up. Uh, but it was an audio-only experience. We didn't have a, a visual sighting. It was myself and four friends and experienced what many people would associate with the Sasquatch phenomenon and sort of these intimidating loud sounds from branch breaking and a tree being pushed over or the sound of a tree cracking and falling and these loud percussive sounds and vocalizations. And so, uh, but because we didn't see the things, we couldn't really reconcile it. You know, it didn't seem that there were human interlopers that we were dealing with and they certainly didn't behave like any normal animals. And so that was in 1999, uh, way back in the 1900s. And, uh, and then I later stumbled across Sasquatch information online a couple of years later and honestly thought the proposition was fairly ridiculous that there could be, you know, an undescribed species of hominoid in North America. And to make a long story short, as I started reading eyewitness testimonies and learning about people who had claims uh, related to experiences that were very similar to what we experienced, that was pretty eye opening. And then to hear purported vocalization recordings that were nearly identical to what we heard uh, was very compelling. And so that's really what began the sort of the question in my mind of trying to figure out like, well, could that have been, would, would, would that be actually the simplest explanation for what we encountered and started looking into historical reports and interviewing other local witnesses. And that was all in about 2002. And I thought I will get to the bottom of this pretty quickly. And, here we are 21 years later, and I'm still trying to get to the bottom of it. And I'm still trying to figure out, you know, 
if that's the most reasonable explanation or not. The people that were with you that day, did they also dive into this thirst for knowledge about Sasquatch or did they kind of leave it alone? <laughs> yeah, they really left it alone. I mean, it's an interesting thing to see how people respond to things of that nature. And I've seen this multiple times in my life now where people with a certain sort of like interpretive schema or worldview will more easily accept an explanation that it was just like ethereal or metaphysical or paranormal in nature because they, they still can't reconcile. Well, we know those weren't people that we were encountered in the dark because it was at night in a very dense, you know, Southern Appalachian forest. And they know that it wasn't, you know, bears or deer or some other normal conventional animal. Um, but so some of them thought, oh, no, you know, that place had a reputation for being haunted. And that's just what we experienced. It's just some sort of, you know, haunting behavior. Elementals, you know, I've heard all sorts of terms being thrown out. And, I mean, I've, I've experienced it later in life with other friends in the field who were not investigating the Sasquatch phenomenon, but who were interested in seeing the way that myself and others investigated it had very interesting experience slash encounter, I guess you could say, on the east side of the Cascades in Washington state back in 2010. And there were six of us, myself and my field research partner, and these four essentially skeptics, urbanite skeptics. All four of them saw two upright figures emerge from this forest, walk sort of in our direction. And then once they could see us, they turned and went back into this forest. And myself and my my field research buddy were looking the wrong direction and we missed it. And then we had rocks thrown. It was a wild event, but they were like, no, it can't be because there's no such thing. It just could not have been a Sasquatch. And so uh, two of those people came to visit me here in Tennessee, where I live a few years ago. And I told my wife this story so many times because it happened before we met. That was another couple. I said, hey, tell my wife what happened that night because she's heard my version of it. And so the two of them told the story exactly the way I tell it. And my wife was like, okay, what do you think that was? So we're like, you know, after all these years, we think it had to be ghosts because there's no such thing as a Sasquatch. <laughs> and so, and again, they knew it wasn't people and they knew it wasn't some conventional, again, mundane animal that you'd encounter in the Pacific Northwest. So they rationalized it as, and these are fairly um, materialistic, you know, not spiritually leaning or supernaturally oriented people. But it's funny because the proposition that there could be this species of hominoid of ape in North America that probably, you know, if they do exist, it's probably can hear from Asia where there is a fossil record of very large apes. That's a very simple explanation. It doesn't require any additions to known science. But for some reason, that proposition is very difficult for people to contend with. It's like, okay, well, you think they're ghosts. Like, what do you think a ghost is? Just curious, you know. And immediately rattled off this laundry list, which is really a list of assumptions or respect. Oh, well, a ghost is, you know, a person who's died and they're trapped between worlds. No, they're dead, but, you know, they can't carry on to the next world and they carry on in this world. And it's like, well, wait a minute. You think that's more likely <laughs> animal that fits the description of Sasquatch reports. So, so it's a long winded answer to your question, I suppose. But no, the, the other people, they've been supportive and some of them I'm still in touch with because they're people I grew up with from that first encounter. But they were not, especially in those early years, were like, oh, there's no way. There's no way of such thing as Sasquatch exists. So it had to be ghosts. I, maybe those friends were just trying to rile you up <laughs> when no, they answered your wife. <laughs> that's what that's what they interpreted. And even though, you know, when I lived in the Northwest, I lived out there for three years and uh, spent a lot of time with these people. And, you know, so they heard a lot about my research and the research of others and this, you know, collection of work, but still just would not go there so for some reason of all the propositions that occur you know say the big three being unknown you know mystery apes ufos and apparitions for some reason the idea that apes are around in north america is the most controversial and stigmatized one people have the hardest time with it which to me is preposterous because it's the simplest one it's the most likely of all those phenomena i mean i guess to to clarify that people clearly are having these experiences so there is some phenomena that they're encountering whether it's entirely psychological or entirely physical and like an empirical referent or whether it's some combination of both but the fact of the matter is it's these interpretations well what's behind unidentified objects in the sky well you get a lot of interpretations 
adaptations, non-human intel intelligence, extraterrestrial beings, you know, breakaway civilization, advanced technology, our technology, adversarial technology, etc. What's behind apparitions? And people will say, oh, the consciousness surviving past death or the projection of a living conscious agent or uh, the playback of the environment that's recorded past events, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what's behind the Sasquatch phenomenon? Well, that's easy. There's other animals that sort of fit this description. You know, the other apes or close, you know, human ancestors, let's say, are, are still an option on the table. And there's apes in the fossil record that are a lot like what people describe as the Sasquatch. And that doesn't require, if you think about those other two, a lot of the interpretations around UFOs, around apparitions, whole host of new sciences or at least new discoveries within relevant disciplines for those interpretations to be sufficient and yet people will grab those like it's a matter of fact without questioning it and then i offer up well hey there might be one extra mammal in north america people are like hogwash filth blasphemy you know it's ridiculous so i've encountered that many times Oh, I bet you have. There's certainly a, uh, we were talking about this before we went on air, a stigma, right, attached to these creatures. Now, we were briefly talking about it before we started, but you say Sasquatch. That's the term that you used for your book that you write versus Bigfoot. A lot of people know it as Bigfoot. Tell us all why you choose Sasquatch instead of the term Bigfoot. I mean, they all have cultural baggage and they all carry some degree of like stigma Bigfoot is so goofy sounding to me, and it always has been. And that's sort of the media's go-to word, and it is sort of dismissive. I mean, I, I've made this joke a few times, but it's funny to see, you know, when, when the Yeti sort, sort of emerged in the early 20th century out of Asia and started to get discussed in, you know, uh, the Western world, let's say, there was essentially a typo that accidentally changed one of the letters in the Himalayan word. And so the rough translation of the typo was filthy snowman. And so the press changed that to abominable snowman, which sounds a little like erudite and a little, you know, haughty, abominable snowman. You know, it's, it's sort of like this, not quite scholarly, but it's just funny that in, in the States, you know, they found large tracks and, oh, it's Bigfoot, you know, and so it has this sort of goofy ring to it. Whereas you know, the word Bigfoot was coined essentially in, or was associated with this phenomenon in 1958 and, you know, with a series of tracks that were found and, and cast in the Bluff Creek region, Northern California. But there was a, an English teacher on the Chehalis Re Reservation in Southern British Columbia, uh, J.W. Burns, who wrote a number of articles for a, a magazine called McLean's. And he wrote some of the early articles about indigenous and other, you know, non-native local stories related to these, you know, mystery apes in Southern British Columbia. And so he anglicized a Halcomelum word for the ease of pronunciation and for the ease of print to call it Sasquatch. And that was in 1929. So that's the older of the terms, but it sort of carries the weight of the indigenous and First Nations cultures and the, the melding of that with non-native cultures. So I, I feel like, and it's just frankly, a cooler sounding word than Bigfoot. So to me, that's the term that I always try to lean on because most people hear Bigfoot transmute that in their minds to this, the cultural representations that they've seen associated with that word, which are the monstrous murdering creatures of bad B horror movies or the comical like troglodyte caveman of schlocky sort of things. And so that's when, when people think, oh, you look for Bigfoot, they don't picture you know, some elegantly adapted hominoid. They picture the thing from those B movies. You're looking for that. And so it's it helps divorce that idea a little bit to use the word Sasquatch, at least I hope so. Well, I can certainly appreciate that. I have to say, it sounds like to me your friends that were more willing to call your encounter and put it off on ghost. That's a perfect example, right, of why it's better. The term Sasquatch is better than Bigfoot because Bigfoot really does carry so much stigma and negative connotation with it. Well, I think even back then, our view of it would have been, because I don't remember thinking about Bigfoot very much in those days, obviously, you know. Probably because the way that the media are always portrayed it, for most people, they think of it as a singular figure. 
like a character, like Frankenstein or Dracula or Zeus or something. And so when they, a lot of people, and I've encountered this many times over the last two decades, when they hear about Bigfoot sightings, it's like he was seen again in the mountains and then he made his way down to Texas and was seen there. And then he went over to Georgia and was seen there as if there's just this one immortal <laughs> creature just wandering around North America. And so that's an easily dismissible idea. And I still, you know, it's not as much now, but many times people would be like, oh, so he's in Georgia and he gets around to Oregon. And it's like, no, no one thinks that. No, no serious contender thinks for a second that there's just one, you know. That's probably like I, the normative way of thinking of it. One when we were when we first started this show, it was actually a question I asked. I was like, "Is there just one guilty?" Or like, uh, well, that's the way it's been presented for so long. That's the yeah. way the media has presented it. You know, they use those singular terms, a he, him, uh, you know, as instead of like referring to it as a species or this sighting represented one individual of a species or something like that. So I don't, I don't, I'm not blaming the the public, let's say, for having that impression. So again, in the same way that people would hear that you're searching for Sasquatch and they think that you're looking for this, you know, campfire creature, you know, campfire story monster, some B horror movie monster. And, or they think you're searching for this singular individual. That's not really their fault. It's because what they're hearing, let's say, what they're transmuting is this cultural representation that's been given by the media and, bad movies and schlocky films and things like that oh for sure and is it any wonder right with things like the legend of boggy creek which is still a great movie and and set in rural arkansas or when you had bigfoot battling the six million dollar man you know on television and it was clearly just a really tall big dude dressed up like a bigfoot and you had things like playing the apes coming out it's really no no wonder that it got associated with such a a hokey character is it oh Harry it, it's Hendersons. no surprise at all harry and the hendersons yeah yeah and it makes you wonder you know did the media really take off on it because it was popular and i guess it did become popular but or do you think that there could have been some sort of disinformation campaign going on here like maybe this is a real thing and and somebody is behind possibly steering public perception away from the possibility of a biological reality? No, I really don't. You know, in, in all the years of doing this and networking with so many people, interviewing so many hundreds and hundreds of witnesses, and many of whom held government jobs, you know, whether that's state government, federal governments, and in all sorts of, whether it's, you know, Department of Agriculture over the U.S. Forest Service or Department of the Interior over the Park Service or BLM or something of that nature. I've never seen anything that would lead me to believe that there is an institutional cover up by the government. Now, what I've seen is that there is a suppression and the suppression always happens at the level of the individual, you know, because it is it was already stigmatized, you know, prior to these things. And so people that have encounters or have sightings, or at least that claim to have encounters or claim to have sightings or that find or document tracks are very, you know, they're, they're disincentivized to talk about such things in their professional capacity or in a professional setting. And so most people just don't tell anyone. A small number of those people will tell a loved one, you know, a close family member, a spouse, a friend, uh, some, someone of that nature. And a very small subset of those will tell a complete stranger, like a you know a Sasquatch researcher or investigator or something of that nature. And so, one of the questions that I've always asked people, and at this point, you know, I've interviewed over two thousand witnesses since two thousand two. Um, a lot of that was you know, during the period of time when I was with the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, especially once Finding Bigfoot became popular. Then a lot of reports were coming in. Well, let's say I've interviewed that many claimants. You know, one question I would always ask is like, well, did you ever feel like reporting this to an authority, law enforcement, game wardens, and that nature? And the answer was 99.9% .9 of the time, no. Like, well, did you ever feel like reporting this to local media? And it was absolutely not. And I've seen the same with people in these government roles, you know, whether they are encounters on military installations, which do happen, like Fort Bragg in North Carolina, Fort Lewis in Washington, some of these other places. They just don't report it to anyone. First of all, it's not what they're there to do. 
they're, they're not there to discover new species that's sort of outside of their purview. And they know they're not going to be believed and are very often in positions where to make a claim that's unbelievable might open you up to a whole lot of trouble, you know, certain sorts of like evaluations or things of that nature. And so that's just not reported. So the suppression seems to always happen at the individual level. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing that play out in real time right now with some of these military government whistleblowers. And then out of nowhere, their entire life becomes fodder for the media and they can take the smallest thing and and really try to twist it against you. And we talked to Trisha Cornwell about her upcoming book called Unnatural Death. And basically there's a Bigfoot involved, right? And one of the characters is really into the Bigfoot phenomenon, but that opens them up to being questioned on a professional level. So it's certainly a real thing. One of the reasons we're here is because, Matt, you have written a fantastic new book called The Phenomenal Sasquatch. And folks, you can buy The Phenomenal Sasquatch right now. If you head over to BigfootUFO.com, there's a link right at the top there. You can purchase Matt's incredible book, The Phenomenal Sasquatch. I've read it. I would call it nothing short of groundbreaking and and its contribution to the scientific field of knowledge of Sasquatch. And our listeners want to know, what was your inspiration for writing The Phenomenal Sasquatch? Well, thank you so much for the kind words. Very, very generous of you. You know, having pursued it for this long, both you know heavily in the field, and I still continue to pursue field research very heavily to this day, uh, but also sort of in the armchair. You know, I think a good researcher should be equal parts armchair and, and field research, the sort of like conceptual analysis as well as like practical field work. I heard it described as like from the, the propositional to the participatory, like a good blend of those two. And so over the years of just speaking with so many people about the subject, you know, I started doing media interviews about the Sasquatch phenomenon in 2007. So I've been speaking publicly about it for a long time and just had the good fortune of, of interacting with people who said, hey, you should write a book because there's some some that you have to offer that I think people should, should know about, which was very generous. We'll see if that's true or not. But, uh, you know, the other big motivation was very often I'm always asked, you know, like, what books would you recommend? And, you know, as you can see, like, there's no shortage of, of books on the Sasquatch. Like, this shelf here is almost, that's all strictly Sasquatch or Mystery Ape related books. And so, of course, I have the, the top five that I consider to be required reading. And then, you know, they'd stretch out to the top 10 that would be, like, suggested or, like, you know, heavily suggested reading and stretch that out to the top 15 or 20. And so the other aim I had was, like, well, I would love to write the kind of book that I wish was available for me when I first started looking into the subject and that I wish was available for me now, 20 years into it. So it wouldn't just be a cursory overview or an introduction, but it would also be very relevant to people, even if they're already devoted students of the subject. So what I was aiming for, and we'll see if I hit it or not, but uh, the feedback has been very kind, thankfully, but you know, I, I wanted it to be the sort of book that if someone only ever read one book about the subject, they could read this one and have a very thorough education on the entirety of the phenomenon thus far and sort of like synthesize a lot of the greatest things that have been written so far in, in my estimation and then expand and develop that beyond what had already been written or said or explored through my own essentially the, the lens that I see it through to get people to see it the way I sort of see it. So all of that kind of coalesced in that project and it, it took three years because it's all me. I did everything myself, so it, it took a, a minute for sure. Well, well, I tell you what, I think you've definitely accomplished something. I mean, I think it's definitive. I would call it the definitive Sasquatch book, hands down. Hard very nine. kind of you. I tell you what, chapter one is a great example because I love how you just get right after it in chapter one, which is called the fundamental question. And you don't hold back. You go right into it. What is the source of the Sasquatch phenomenon? And you've mentioned a little bit about this already, and it's really multifactorial, right? You know, some biological and some other. What can you tell us about what is the source of the Sasquatch phenomenon? I wish I knew, you know, I, I'm, I'm seeking the origins. Uh, so I, uh -huh. no one has a demonstrative sort of proof of like, what is the source? But you know, without... What, if we're staying in the realm of the known, 
So we're not invoking, again, sort of, I don't want to say fringe as a pejorative, but if we're not going to invoke like the extraterrestrial, the supernatural, the physical, the otherworldly, it's like, okay, well, the argument that's been, the debate that's been raging for these many decades, you know, since the birth of Bigfoot in 1958 and the dawn of field research and people sort of chasing the, the Sasquatch phenomenon in the field is that, well, either there are animals fitting the description of claimants and that have feet that are shaped like the tracks that are associated with the phenomenon, or if no such animal exists, then it has to be some product of the human mind, some element of the human psyche. In my estimation, like, you know, spoiler alert, it could easily be both that you could have real animals that, you know, trigger certain responses in observers, hardwired, evolutionarily selected responses, both cognitive, uh, psychological, and physiological. And that those sort of, the way that those get represented in, in narratives, you know, in the retelling or the re-representation of such events, those, then they sort of take on mythic qualities, stretch into that sort of category of, of what people have dismissed them as, is like these mythological beings. But to me, if we're looking at the totality of the subject, you know, the claims and the evidence and where they fit in relationship to each other and where they fit in time, then I do think that the simpler explanation or the simpler of those two propositions is that there is a biological source, that there is a species of animal, you know, mammal, likely an ape, fitting the description of eyewitness claims that is at the root of mythos, the sort of cultural representation of these counters. But there are certainly psychological elements associated with it that are sort of projected or, again, represented in the, the retellings of these experiences or these observations. And so that's the, to me, the fundamental question is trying to, well, how do we conclusively demonstrate that? And no one's done that yet on either side of the debate. You know, they've not been able to identify some element of the human mind or the brain or the psyche. There's no laboratory and hallucinations that produce phenomenologically authentic eight foot tall hair covered apes you know in in lab settings and there's no physical remains of the sasquatch yet it's a huge conundrum but again what i'm trying to do with the book is to lay out everything that's sort of been discovered let's say thus far always through those lenses like what's more likely that this is just the product of the human mind or that there really is an animal species responsible for this in your research for the book, what is the oldest account of a Sasquatch sighting that you came across? And could you tell us a little bit about it? Well, it really just depends. I mean, it gets really tricky the further back you go in time, because obviously they are, there are written accounts that go back as far once the written word was introduced in North America by non-natives, because you know, in, the indigenous peoples were, they passed down information orally. And so they, they didn't have an externalized written record of these stories. So we don't know how old a lot of those stories are, but there are these ape-like creatures that are in a number of indigenous oral traditions and that are also represented in art. Uh, you know, whether there's pictographs, petroglyphs, these sort of stone carvings, totems, etc., that people interpret as being associated with Sasquatch phenomenon. The other tricky part of that is that like once non-natives came to North America and began to collect these stories, well, first of all, they dismissed a lot of it as just superstition. Then again, there's no catch-all term at that time. The Europeans really had nothing, or just the non-natives in general had nothing like the word bear, you know, where you could encounter a number of tribes and they might describe particularly animal. Oh, that's a bear. That's a bear. That's a bear. Well, they were in the dark ages of understanding apes. I mean, gorillas weren't discovered all the Shayu in the mid 1800s. And then mountain gorillas weren't officially recognized until the early 1900s, 1902. And so because in the 1700s and early 1800s, there weren't a lot of reference, you know, things that they could sort of compare that to. Our reference is animals that walk on two legs habitually that are man-like or man-shaped, uh, but much, much larger that are covered in hair that are very active at night, tend to have very broad shoulders. They have tracks that are about a foot and a half long. They go by various terms. And so those descriptions do date back to the late 1700s and the early 1800s. And then once you have the media, I think it gets very interesting there because when you're talking about the indigenous traditional ecological knowledge or oral traditions, they were recorded by non-natives, again, in a dismissive way because they're describing, oh, if they Bear with me if I trouble you with some of their superstitions, just very hand-waving dismissals. And so they're not highly detailed. 
and then they are also very generalized. Whereas once you get print media, first, you know, in more like circulars, you have like, you know, John Smith on Beef Creek at the foot of, you know, whatever Stone Mountain saw this thing on this day, this month of this year, you get these really specific testimonies. And so those go back as long as there's been print media. And, you know, I outline a few of those in my book. But if you can see this book there, the historical Bigfoot, I mean, that's like 1200 pages of print media articles describing, you know, what we would associate with the Bigfoot or the Sasquatch, people seeing these you know, larger than a human man shaped animals in forested environments in North America. Tell you what, just all the more reason people need to get off their phones and go out, <laughs> go out in the woods and open their eyes. We're talking to Matt Pruitt, author of the phenomenal Sasquatch producer of the Bigfoot and Beyond podcast with Cliff Bobo, two of our favorites as well. And CJ, I believe you have some listener comments and questions for Matt. If he's up for that. Matt. Yes, so we'll dive right in here. We've got Simon asking, what has been the most significant encounter you have researched or had personally? Oh, man. I'll try to answer both of those. I'll try to make it brief. <laughs> I've interviewed so many witnesses that were so compelling. I, I'm telling you, been, you know, interviewing about esoteric phenomena or esoteric subjects, things of that nature. There is something really powerful and compelling and almost transformative about sitting face to face with someone as they describe their experience. You know, especially people when you can do a lot of research and you realize like they seem to be of unimpeachable character. They hold positions of authority. They're highly esteemed in their communities. They seem to be of sound mind. They don't have anything to gain. This interview is totally off the record. They're just telling me, you know, so that we can have a discussion. They're not trying to gain anything out of it. Those sorts of experiences with witnesses can be really powerful. So many, but I mean, obviously the ones near and dear to me, there's several encounters that happened very close to where I grew up. Like one of which is less than, it's about half a mile from the house I grew up in. And that one was featured on Finding Bigfoot. I was working with the advanced production team, was a field coordinator and fixer for what became the premiere episode of that series, which we filmed in my hometown based on all the reports I'd aggregated and pieces of evidence that were given to me that were used in that show. And one of the witnesses, and I know I've told this story on other podcasts recently, so it was it was really impactful for me is that, you know, I was really young at the time, although I'm still very young now, at least I feel that way, but I was much yeah, younger yeah. back then. Yeah. So I, you know, I was just bursting at the seams with excitement about the Sasquatch thing, which I still kind of am, but I've learned to, you know, control it a bit more. There was a witness who claimed to have seen a Sasquatch cross the road following a creek and she was coming down this hill as it crested the bank and stepped onto the road. And she slammed on her brace and it came to a halt in the road. And she slammed, skidded to a stop in front of it. So she saw it very well, fully illuminated by her headlights. This was not, you know, obstructed by brush or vegetation or anything of that nature. And so she could see it very clearly as she described it. And they had a sort of a face off for a few seconds and then it continued on its way. This being so close to the house I grew up in. I mean, I could go out my back door and walk through the woods and be at this spot in minutes. You know what I mean? And she was an upstanding person in the community, local business owner, very successful business owner. You know, I was able to make contact with her and she was like, yeah, why don't you meet me at the spot? We'll just pull off the side of the road and I'll show you where it happened. And so she's sort of reliving it because, you know, what's interesting too is that this happened in 1999. Her encounter was on Thanksgiving Day. And my encounter was also in 1999, but it was in the summer. And from the house I grew up in and where her encounter was, and my first encounter is only like another couple miles away. So it, it might have been the same individual that we heard is the same one that she saw. Who knows? But so we're standing at the spot and she's describing the experience to me. And I wasn't paying close enough attention to see that, you know, it was really bothering her to discuss this because she had been very frightened by the event whereas my brain was just like it's like that the spoof of a beautiful mind you know where zach galifianakis is in the the casino and all the numbers of the, all every sasquatch report and like you know they always follow the creeks and all this stuff so i'm i was thinking out loud when she told me the story and i was like i wonder what it was doing here you know there's this waterway and it comes out of this area and you know there's some open meadows over there and there i you know because i drive through there like, i've seen deer forging and maybe he's going after the deer and just a mile a minute 20 something year old me and she said have you seen one kind of harshly and i said no i haven't 
She said, then you don't know. I thought I was going to die. And it was very serious. And I had to realize like, okay, well, this thing that's so cool and exciting to me was not cool or exciting for her. I saw firsthand people in her life laugh in her face telling the story. And then, you know, I had to educate them about the subject and other local history. And they listened a little bit more. But so she had already gone through a few years of that by that point. No one believed her. And so not only was this frightening experience, you know, she was subject to just trying to, she had taken her daughter food on Thanksgiving night and was driving back home. And this happened. And then no one believes her. Let's tell people that she saw this thing. The way she described it to me, she said, have you ever been, she said, it didn't do anything threatening. It just basically stood there. But she said it was so big. She said, have you ever been driving down the road and someone swerves into your lane? Like they're about to, and you just know you're about to have head on collision. And I was like, oh yeah. And she said, that's exactly what this felt like. Like experientially. It's just terror. And that has always stuck with me. And, you know, it was a lesson I needed. And I'm glad I learned it early on is that, you know, again, this thing that I think is so exciting and cool is not necessarily, for most witnesses, they don't find it that exciting and cool, even in retrospect, very often. That so sort of brings us to our next question, the idea of being made fun of and stigma. We have Eliza Harley Quinn here is asking, and this is a long one, aside from the general stigma of reporting a Bigfoot sighting, do you think that if there was an actual protocol or procedure to doing so, people would be more likely to speak up? Or would you think the stigma is still too strong and wouldn't make a difference? It's a good question. To be continued. Thanks. Like. Share. Follow. Comment, subscribe, support. What's your hot take on Travis Taylor? <laughs> I've got an exclusive for you guys if you okay. want it about yeah, the absolutely. Alaska. We do. Okay, okay. More at BigfootUFO.com. All things unexplained. So some of that I think, sir, will save for post session. Mm-hmm.